Welcome to my talk. My name is Sven Charleer. I'll be talking about designing real-time dashboards to support esports spectating. I'll be talking about a few things today. Uh, first of all, I'll sort of talk about where I'm coming from, um, the research I've done before I started doing uh, this work on esports spectating. Then I'll talk about spectator experience itself and how we created dashboards for that. I'll also discuss open data uh, regarding game metrics and how we can solve that. And then I'll talk about more research that also other people are doing uh, in this field. So let, let me first start, you know, tell you a, a little bit about myself. So I, um, I've always been a gamer. Uh, the entire family here are gamers. So we play Animal Crossing quite a bit, as probably most of you out there do now. Here's my daughter playing Battlefield. You know, really proud that she's actually gotten into games. It took a, a while. Um, now, I have a bit of a weird career, so as you can see, I started as a software engineer, then as a UI developer at Monumental Games, and then just spent a few more years working as a software engineer. To mix it even more up, I said at the age of, I think it was 33, uh, let's try and, you know, pursue a page PhD, you know, why not? I haven't done that before. So I uh, did a PhD at the KU Leuven, um, which actually most of the talk is going to be about the work I did at KU Leuven. I stayed there as a postdoc to do a bit of more work. And now I'm actually freelancing in things like data visualization, UX. And I'm also a lecturer at the AP um, University College in Antwerp. Okay, so regarding the research I was doing, uh, my research wasn't focused on games at all. It was focused on uh, students. Back then, it was getting quite popular, the quantif quantified self uh, movement. If you remember that, it started off with the Fitbits and all that. People were trying to gather information regarding their activities, what they were doing. And through devices, through dashboards, they were seeing their progress and you know, getting insights in, in you know, how well they were doing, what they should change about their ways and whatnot. You know, and were motivational tools as well, giving insights and all that. We sort of looked at that and thought we can use that for students. Maybe we can make their process of studying, of working, you know, better uh, if they get better insights in how well they are doing. So there's two ways of approaching this. One way is the machine learning way, which you see here on the left. It's an interesting paper where what they do is for like these online courses, they show a um, traffic light, traffic light saying, okay, red, everything's going really bad or something, you know, going terribly wrong, wrong and you're not going to make it. And there's green, which just says like, okay, great, everything's fine, which is an interesting approach, right? You know, the student has sort of information knowing whether he's doing well or not. Uh, the only problem is there's not a lot of insight into why, you know, you're getting, for example, a red traffic light. Why are you doing a bad job? On the right side, you know, we're talking about the augmenting human intellect. This is uh, uh, from Doug Engelbart, which is... Uh, which was the idol of my late professor. He didn't want to feed information such as, you know, you should do this or that. He wanted to provide information that you could learn from, you know, where you could get insights from. So when we're talking about student data, um, I've visualized that in quite a few ways. Uh, you can see a few examples here on screen where I'm using a big tabletop to, for example, visualize information uh, in graphs, but also in badges, which they can drag around and they can start comparing with each other. So this is with this group mechanic, right, where people are actually talking to each other about the data, which is quite interesting. Uh, at the right top, you see a dashboard, which is actually placed in a, in a classroom where people are uh, following a class. Meanwhile, there's live data being updated of what is going on in the class, right? Giving them insights on how the groups in this case are all uh, doing. Uh, left bottom, you see a dashboard which is used to support students and with uh, counseling, right? So when they're having issues with their grades, they can come uh, see uh, one of these advisors and they will use a dashboard to start this um, dialogue about the data with the student providing much more insights than you would in a normal case where this data would not be available to the student, right? So eventually, you know, I've got this itch where I always want to do something games related. So during the postdoc, I was actually able to use all this research we had and try to apply it uh, to video games. So that brings me to the actual research, right, regarding spectator experience. So first of all, I have to thank all these people. Uh, this was a really big team effort. We had no funding, so this wasn't an easy task. So when we're talking about user experience, we often talk about, you know, how can we improve uh, the experience for the 
player, right? That's 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 pretty obvious. We have the game, we have the player. Um, so you know, using UI elements, using uh, sound effects, we can make them better aware of what's going on. You know, whether they're dying, whether they're being attacked, how how is their ammo doing, for example. And then there's of course uh, streaming. You know, when we have a player who streams a video game, there's interaction with the audience, right? We have audience interacting with the streamer, uh, streamer interacting with the game. And then you know, one of those special cases where we have the spectator also being the player and interacting with the game directly right this is twitch plays pokemon we have like i don't know how many people on that stream watching that stream and interacting with the game uh, using these commands so we have a sort of spectator interaction with the game when we're talking about esports uh, we have a bit of a different situation we have esports players uh, interacting with the game the spectators are usually much more passive right they can chat with each other so there's an interaction between the spectators um, but you know if, if you're sitting in a stadium or if you're sitting at home usually the interaction with the game is very minimum right uh, you're just being you're very passive about it and there's a lot of research that can be done in that area like how to improve that spectator experience now we're not going to talk here about you know uh, interacting with the players or interacting with the game because this is an esports event and event and we cannot do that right what we can do is try to improve their experience by maybe improving how they see the game how they understand the game now our research was focused on dashboards like how can we use dashboards to improve that experience of the spectator uh, we looked at two games league of legends a moba uh, and counter-strike and fps we took a approach where we looked at the user needs uh, we sort of tried to figure out, okay, what would a spectator of one of these eSport games want? What would they need when they're watching a game? We used an iterative design process to actually design these dashboards, you know, and get our feedback from the users while we are designing. Uh, and then we ended with a big final user evaluations to get, you know, proper uh, research data uh, regarding our dashboard. So first of all, for the user needs, we used a Reddit, we put online some surveys on Reddit, uh, we got 167 responses on the League of Legends one and 596 on the Counter-Strike one. Uh, the communities on Reddit are actually very useful if you want to do these kinds of surveys because they're very passionate about their games and if they can have a say, that's, they're really happy to do that. For the iterative design process, uh, we focused on two things during that time. Usability, you know, are these things usable and do people understand uh, what's going on on our dashboards? And we used Think Aloud, you know, so they would sit in front of the dashboard, try it out and have to say out loud what, what is going on, you know, what they're seeing, what they're doing, what they're thinking. And we used also semi-structured interviews to get even more data uh, regarding, you know, what their thoughts were on the dashboards. For this process, we used first paper prototypes. We created digital mockups, which didn't do anything, weren't interactive, but were just, you know, visually a bit more pleasing and more understandable for the user, I guess. And in the end, we had interactive prototypes uh, working with the uh, real data of the games. And then we ended up with a final user evaluation where we had 18 participants, we had a semi-structured interviews, we used eye tracking to see, you know, what parts of the screen that caught their interest and whether they were looking at the game or not. And we did an inductive thematic analysis of the entire interview uh, transcription. So out of the analysis came a bunch of interesting themes. First of all, there was the impact on the spectator experience, which was talked about most. Uh, we had the, you know, the, the need for flexible and lightweight dashboards, uh, impact on Cognitive load, you know, how much are they being distracted by this dashboard, for example. Trust and complexity of the information that we were visualizing. Contextual factors, you know, regarding how and what they're watching. And then usability. So first, uh, I'll just show the dashboards, the, the end results that we achieved. Um, this was the Counter-Strike dashboard. So on the top left, you see the progression of the rounds. And the colors indicate who's won which round, right? And how they've won, whether, you know, it's true killing everyone or, or detonating the bomb, right? There's also uh, more information regarding, you know, if you look at B, it's more information regarding uh, the money distribution uh, during the different rounds. Uh, there's a map which we already can see which activities have happened where on the map. Uh, D shows the two teams and information regarding every single player how many kills and deaths and all that. Uh, e again, it's a simple visualization of the mana distribution and F shows an average damages per round. So you sort of have an idea of how that's progressing. So for the League of Legends one, on the 
top right you see the two teams and you see the first part is gold it shows the gold distribution during the entire game so you can see which team has how much gold during a specific time in the game uh, below that we have damage you're also able to switch to recent damage so you can actually see uh, in the last team fight who did the most damage who did the least damage and all that right Below that is vulnerability, but I'll get back to that later. It shows how vulnerable every uh, player is at a specific time in the game. There's also a pathing widget, which actually shows the, the path ever the jungler has taken, right? The guy who doesn't have the specific lane fixed. You can see who where he's going, uh, which steps he's taking, and then who's, where he's ganking and all that. Here's a little video of the dashboards in action. We're first showing the League of Legends one, and afterwards you will get to see the Counter-Strike one. A little bit of background information regarding how we actually pulled this off. The League of Legends one is using the Riot API, which is actually being, which is actually broadcasting data regarding the game live uh, during their esports events. Uh, the Counter Strike one is using the demo files, so we are actually processing those uh, post games, so they're not live. Okay, so from all these findings, we came up with a bunch of design goals. Uh, you can sort of take whatever you need from each of these goals and you know when you're developing something depending on on what you are planning on doing but these are good guides sort of to follow when you're trying to design a dashboard for live esports spectating so we have glanceability adaptability intelligence and transparency i'll go through each of them so first of all we have glanceability so what we're doing is we have a high-paced video game right uh, lots of action going on uh, certainly you know league of legends counter-strike it's, it's certainly league of legends where there's so many things at the same time going on your screen right uh, very hard to understand uh, now we're adding even more data on the screen uh, which might be a bit of a problem uh, for the you know cognitive load of the user so the spectator is already watching the game now he's got to watch the data as well uh, this can get distracting and we don't want that we want to make sure that we provide the data in if in a way that doesn't distract too much from the game right what are solutions for that making sure that maybe there's not too much interactivity that all the data is just available right there we have some buttons where we can click on the league of legends one for example maybe that's not ideal you know you want them to watch the game get the data in the periphery there's lots of research regarding ambient displays there's a lot to be learned from there as well uh, one of the other things we can do is maybe overlay on the game. Now, now we're using separate dashboards, uh, you know, above and, and to the right of the video game. If you integrate them into the game, maybe even into the you know, 3D environment of the game, this could be much more beneficial. We've seen people, you know, in our uh, evaluation uh, complain about it where they're saying like, okay, maybe I want to watch this later with the dashboard. It's very useful, but not while I'm enjoying this uh, match, right? I want to watch it afterwards uh, with the dashboard and then I can get better insights of what is going on. Someone else said, okay, now uh, there was a lot of damage going on. So I was looking at recent damage, but I just missed the team fight completely, which, you know, is not something we want to happen either, right? This is an important moment. You've just missed it because you were looking at the dashboard. So eye tracking is ideal to figure that out, right? We saw, for example, that a lot of people were actually staring at a dashboard uh, during the games. But this, you know, this wasn't a long-term evaluation study. So maybe if we were spreading it out over a longer time, people would get used to the dashboard. And there's a sort of novelty factor. There's also the evaluation setting. But still, you know, there's a lot of uh, distraction by the dashboard. We want them to look at the dashboard, that's for sure. Otherwise, it's pointless to have it even there, right? But we don't want, for example, what we see in participant 8 on the right, where this person is actually staring at a dashboard non-stop and is not even looking at the game anymore. That's that's no good. If we look at participant two on the left, there's much more back and forward between the dashboard and the game. And you could think, okay, during downtime, during you know boring moments maybe in the game, people would look at a dashboard more often. That would be okay. Now, this is one of those default streaming overlays, right? During, during one of the Counter-Strike games. It's not a great visualization, but at least you know they're showing a lot of information there's nothing going on this is the buying phase like there's a bit too much information here you know we don't need the map it's the buying phase right but 
all this information at least integrated into the game, which you know people don't have to look back and forth between the game and a dashboard to actually see what they want to see, right? But as I said, that map shouldn't be there. And that actually brings me to the next point, which is contextual factors, which is part of design goal adapt adaptability, where what we want to say is that it doesn't always needs, needs to be a fixed dashboard with fixed information. The thing is we have, you know, we have different contextual factors. We have, for example, the game phase. Uh, when it's laning phase in League of Legends, it's it's a quite boring sort of phase and there's not that much information you need to visualize. But when a team fight breaks out, that's, you know, then you may want to focus on the damage, what kind of abilities are being used and all that. But that information is not useful during the laning phase, so your dashboard could adapt to those kind of situations. Uh, there's the environment, you know, if someone's watching at a stadium versus someone watching at a pub or versus someone watching at home, you may might want to design a different dashboard for that or at least have different parts available to them. Maybe it needs to be more interactive when someone's playing at home. Uh, we have the viewer type. Maybe it's someone who just wants to watch the game casually. And for some people, you know, just like in football, maybe their score is plenty. Someone who wants to learn more about the game wants more detailed information. So it's good to think about that. Now let's take, for example, a team manager. You know, they want probably very detailed, very fast paced information, maybe even have machine learning actually, you know, making suggestions of what should be happening, you know, what the team should be doing, which then the team manager can relay to the players. Uh, and then there's also, you know, people who just want to watch in replay. You know, you can go as detailed as you want uh, once you're in replay, because you could pause, you could rewind um, and all that. Part of the adaptability design goal, um, there's a, a need for lightweight and flexible dashboards, right? So, for example, someone said, I think there is too much information on the dashboard. You know, maybe you can personalize certain things. You could say, okay, let's say we let the user, you know, change the dashboard the way they want. Some people even said like, okay, I want to actually take this dashboard onto a separate device. But regarding this flexibility, it brings me to another point. Uh, it's the one of intelligence. And, you know, combining everything we just said, you know, for example, this person said, okay, damage across the entire game is interesting when not much is going on, but it would be nice if it would automatically switch to recent damage when damage is done. And here we can use, you know, uh, some sort of intelligence which says like, okay, when specific events are happening in the game, just switch what the dashboard is showing us. When we talk about intelligence, we can also talk about how we can use the data to sort of make predictions. So what we see here is we see the vulnerability of each player, right? So uh, the top ones are the most vulnerable, the bottom ones are the least vulnerable. And we can calculate that and actually show the user or well, show the spectator, you know, these guys are in danger. And you know, for example, people said, okay, the vulnerabilities help me understand why certain junglers, you know, choose to gank a specific lane. Okay, so that brings me to the last design goal, which is transparency. And uh, as I mentioned before, right, we can have systems being automated, right? We have aggregation of specific information, but we can also automate things. For example, with the vulnerabilities, we could say, okay, we can make that a bit more extreme and we can actually say, okay, someone's going to die within X amount of time, right? That's valuable information. We're talking about predictions and we're talking about recommender systems or whatnot. There's always a problem of trust. Uh, it's always it always feels a bit like a black box system. While uh, you know some people actually appreciate that, just like the comment here on screen, and they're happy to you know to not have to think about it and just get the information from us. Uh, some people are very critical and they'll be like, okay, I don't really trust what you're doing. Uh, give me the information. I want to see why that's happening, and then I'll I'll try and make my own conclusion. Right. And we've done that in the vulnerabilities, where uh, here you can see the parameters that cause this vulnerability, right? There's health on the left, there's location, and there's their cooldown on their abilities, right? Using those specific parameters, we calculate uh, the vulnerability. This actually gives the spectator insight into how we are calculating things, which helps them trust the system. Uh, this work was uh, published in uh, at the Kai Play conference in Australia. If you want to read more, if you want to go more into detail regarding you know all the things I've said, because I've really glanced over it, uh, you can check out that paper and you can read all about it. That brings me to open data. Uh, so as I said, we used uh, API from uh, League of Legends to do the dashboard for League of Legends. We did the demo files uh, for Counter-Strike. There's a bit of a problem that uh, if you look at uh, the data, it's completely different, right? Uh, on one, the top you see League of Legends, uh, there's the, you know, uh, WebSocket, 
And for Counter-Strike, you know, we use the demo files and one is more focused on contextual data. It actually shows the state of the game. And every time the game, you know, there's an update, it's just an update of the state. While Counter-Strike, it actually focuses on events. It's just sending events. And we don't have a lot of information regarding the state. We have to sort of figure that out ourselves uh, with these changes. Again, we have two, you know, formats eventually, which aren't compatible. We can't reuse widgets of our dashboards and all that. Uh, and it's not a bad idea to try and uh, fix that during uh, using a you know standardized format. And what we suggested here was something called XVGM, which is itself is itself derived from XAPI, which is actually a standardized format they use for tracking you know what students are doing and, and gathering information regarding students' activities. So if 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 you have this standardized format, it you could do quite a few things, right? With a standardized format like this, you could say, okay, we create converters for existing games. Fine, that's not too hard to do. We could make ones for League of Legends, here's the Storm, Counter-Strike, you know, there's ways of, 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 of doing those steps, right? Uh, what would be even better if it's standardized is that, you know, people would just implement into their video games. Why make your own uh, data type when you can use an open format, which means that any dashboard created out there, you know, uh, could be used on top of your game. So what can we use this for, right? We can, okay, right, real-time data visualization, fine. You know, we can create dashboards, and these dashboards could work across different kind of games. We could use for data mining. We could use for reporting, great. We could use for quantified self. Now, this is interesting for players, right? I want more information regarding how I'm doing, and I want to get further insights. But this is even better for teams, right? Esports teams, where if they would have these tools available where they can just any game you know, export the data, plug it into whatever dashboard they have and get those in, that information regarding how they're doing, what they should change and all that. It's, it becomes very interesting. There's a lot of stuff we can do once people start adapting, you know, this open data format. There's a, a short paper that you can read, uh, which uh, I did together with Catherine Gerling uh, regarding this XVGM format and all the issues and all the possibilities. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I, I urge you to uh, check that out. If you can't find it, just contact me and I will be able to forward you that paper. So I'd like to end with focusing on the other research that's being done in this area. Uh, there's actually a lot going on, and we've recently done an online workshop. It was called Be Part of It, Spectator Experience in Gaming and Esports. There were 13 papers accepted and published. You can find them all on the website uh, link uh, down there. I will focus on two of them. Uh, they were all equally interesting, but these are just two that are very related uh, to what I've been showing you today. Uh, first up is the interactive visualization for strategy acquisition in esports spectatorship. So if I, as I've mentioned before, right, it, some people actually want to explore the data afterwards with these kind of dashboards. Now, StratMapper is a really cool tool where they allow you to explore all the different data points of a video of a game, right? All the different players have their events and all these events are displayed at the bottom over time and are displayed also on the map on top, right? So what a user can do is they can select a specific set of events which look interesting, uh, actually mute and unmute specific events from specific players just to focus on the ones that are relevant and leave annotations and actually leave notes for other users to find and discuss you know what is going on. So it's a really cool exploratory tool. Um, for more details, do check out their paper. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the video is also available on Vimeo, which you can check uh, where they explain it much better than I do. Now, the other paper I wanted to mention is toward GameAware streaming interface. Now, they've done something pretty cool is that they, this is again for live streams. So uh, people watching a game live what they do is send extra metadata uh, next to the stream, uh, which allows you to show overviews on top of the stream, which the spectators can interact with. For example, this is a tower defense game, right? The cursor you see is the cursor of the spectator. So what they can do is they can hover over the stream and get information uh, regarding the objects in the game. Like for example, he wants to see, you know, information regarding the turret. Uh, this is another one where if you click uh, on this, specific menu item, you get information regarding the next wave of enemies. What kind of enemies are those going to be? That's something the player doesn't know. So you get actually more information than the player. Uh, and they've got a bunch more of these interesting interactions with, uh, the, with the games. 
Um, check out the paper if you want to learn more. They'll be able to explain it much better. So thank you uh, for your attention and being here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, do keep in touch. Uh, here's my LinkedIn, my Twitter, uh, my mail and whatnot. Uh, if you want to learn more, let me know. If I can ever help you out with any of this stuff, uh, do let me know as well. Thank you.